my name's Paul Grogan. Welcome to the Gaming Rules monthly video log for July 2021. Now, a few things before we start. Uh, apologies that this is a little bit late. I normally try and do these in the second week of every month, uh, but last week, last week my workload got a little bit out of control. So I tried to concentrate on that this week, doing it this week. The other thing before we start, if I look like I'm about to fall asleep and really hot, um, it's because it's really hot. We're in the middle of a heat wave here in the UK at the moment. Uh, and not only is it super, super warm, we have no breeze whatsoever. We've got all of the windows in our house open. Uh, it doesn't help them sat here with the lights on. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm struggling a bit at the, <laughs> at the moment. So yeah, apologies for that. Anyway, I'm going to talk about all of the games that I've played since the last video log. And because this one is slightly delayed, that means this is going to be a bumper issue. Uh, this video log is going to cover all of the games that I've played from... The 11th of May? No, no, that can't be right. 11th of June, it must be. 11th of June through to pretty much yesterday. Um, so it's going to be five weeks worth. So it might be a bit longer than normal. Grab a hot or cold beverage of your choice and grab a comfortable seat. And after talking about all of the games that I've played, I'm going to give you a Patreon update, let you know about the next contest, some personal news and some various other bits. So first of all, let's crack on with all of the games that I've played. Starts off on the 11th of June with Merlin the big box edition. Now I say it's the big box edition because that's what I've got. Uh, I am a fan of the original game of Merlin. I only picked up, I think, one of the mini expansions when it came out. Uh, but Queen Games did a Merlin big box edition with all of the expansions in it, all of the Queenie expansions and an extra module as well. Uh, so we played that. Nick and Gemma came around. They hadn't been played before. I'd been really wanting to play it again for quite a while. Uh, and I've heard that the expansions can make it a lot better. Now, a couple of people said that the expansions make it worse and just stick with the base game. But what we did that day, and the video's on the channel now if you're interested in learning uh, how to play Merlin, because I do a full tutorial of the game at the start, uh, because Nick and Gemma hadn't played it before, and then we do a three-player game of it. So although we played the big box edition, because they hadn't played before, we played the base game. No expansions, no little mini expansions whatsoever, and I know a couple of people think that some of the mini expansions are essential. I don't think so. I think the base game is fine. It's probably a bit better with some of the mini expansions. Sure. Um, I really like Merlin. It is one of the Stefan Feld games, which doesn't get a lot of love. I remember when it came out, a lot of people went, oh, Feld's gone off the rails. He's, he's losing his way. This isn't as good as his previous games. I will admit, it's not as good as Trajan, for example, which I really like. But I think Merlin is a solid game. Um, I actually did a review of Merlin two, three years ago, whenever. So if you're interested in a review of the game, um, there is a link to that on my channel. Just search for Gaming Rules Merlin Review. But if you prefer to just watch a tutorial and playthrough, that's on the channel now. I really enjoyed it. Um, as I say, Merlin is a game which I am a fan of. There's a couple of bits about it that I'm not 100% on, but overall, I think Merlin is a very good game. Do I want to play it again? Absolutely. Do I want to start playing it again with some of the expansions? Absolutely. Definitely want to play more of it. It's just the usual case of I've not enough time. So that's Merlin. Uh, also on the same day, uh, I did a couple of Patreon only streams. So the Merlin game didn't take all night. So what we did is after we'd done that video, I then decided to, we then chose another game to play and we dug out Mini Express. Now I've not played Mini Express since I was covering it when it was on Kickstarter, however long ago that was. But I have a final copy of Mini Express and I've been wanting to play it again for a while. Nick and Gemma wanted to play it. So I did a couple of games of that. Now these weren't publicly streamed. These were Patreon only stream. So if you are a patron supporter of mine and you want to see a couple of games of Mini Express, um, it was posted about to the Slack channel, but get in contact with me if you want to see them and I can easily send you the link. Uh, Mini Express is a game that I was professionally involved in. Uh, me and my team helped with the rule book for the game uh, and I am going to be doing some promotional videos for them. I say promotional videos. It's, going to, it, it's another playthrough of the, U, of the new UK map, which has recently just been delayed uh, to to next year. I mean, I was supposed to be doing a playthrough of it yesterday, um, but there's been problems with the Kickstarter and they've delayed it. And of course, the, the current situation with international shipping has thrown thrown everything out. Um, so yeah, so Mini Express, best not give my opinion, because as I say, I have been professionally involved in the game. Next up, on the 14th of June, Pathfinder Adventure card game. And for regular viewers of mine, you will know that I've been speaking about this game regularly for the last three months. And that is because I've been playing through a solo campaign of it. The solo campaign using the Dragon's Demand campaign that comes with the core set is nine scenarios uh, and I did scenario number nine. So that's it. That, that series of videos is finished. 
I very, very much enjoy the Pathfinder Adventure card game. I'm not going to repeat myself and say everything that I say about it on the previous, on the, on the other video logs. I might even do like a 10 minute video, like a mini review of that game at some point in the future, because I have so much to say about it. But I thoroughly enjoyed that playthrough series. And scenario nine was actually interesting because the campaign is actually only eight scenarios. I thought it was nine going in, but then after we played scenario eight, you read the, the epilogue at the end of scenario eight and it's like, well, well done, you managed to do this and everything's great and you leave town. I'm like, okay, so what's scenario nine then? Scenario nine is actually really good. It is a kind of semi-randomly generated scenario where you've returned to town and they've given you another job to do. Uh, and you roll a d6 to see which type of scenario it is and then you build this deck randomly. And basically scenario nine is totally replayable. Now all of the other ones are replayable, but they will be similar. Scenario 9 is very replayable because even the objectives change, the monsters change, the locations change. Yeah, it's kind of a random scenario generator. Really enjoyed it. It was a siege scenario. That's on the channel now. And if you're interested in Pathfinder Adventure card game, um, then yeah, there's nine videos on my channel in the last few months. I did cover the game a couple of years ago, um, but this solo playthrough series has been really good. Would I want to play through it again solo, the same campaign using a different character? Yes. Would I want to play the other campaign? Yes. Do I want to play it multiplayer? Yes. Yes to everything. I want to play the game more because I really enjoy it. It's just a bit of a time investment um, because of the campaign nature of it. Oh, we're getting a little bit of a breeze. For the first time in five days, we're actually getting a bit of a breeze. I'm sat downstairs in the dining room and the window is open. I've got the curtains closed, but that's, that's what, new curtains, by the way. Anyway, moving on to games. The 15th of June and the 29th of June, Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now, we should be playing, we'd like to play Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion every Tuesday. Tuesday night is our Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion night. However, as I mentioned at the start, my workload for the last couple of weeks has gone a bit out of control and we haven't played it since. We're due to play it tonight, but that's not going to happen either because I'll be probably editing this video log. So we played two games of Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Without giving any spoilers away, I'm playing the Demolitionist. Uh, and I'm on level five. Vicky's playing the Red Guard. She's on level five. We've been playing it two player. We are on scenario 15, 16, I think. But basically we did a scenario and we failed. Now we have failed scenarios before. We failed scenarios in Gloomhaven before. Uh, but rather than playing that scenario again, we then decided to go off and do one of the other scenarios which had, which had opened up recently. And something's happened that has never happened to me in any of my plays of Gloomhaven in the three years that I've been playing it. We failed two consecutive scenarios. Now, normally what happens is we'll fail one. I mean, we don't normally fail, but when we do fail, we'll then do it again and we'll succeed or we'll do a different one and we'll succeed. We've never had two games back to back, although two weeks apart, where we failed both scenarios. And the reason we failed is we're not very good at the game. Um, I mean, we're not experts at the game. We're good at the game, but we're not experts at the game. But there is the random factor in Gloomhaven. You can get lucky with the enemy cards. You know, the guards can stand there and do nothing when it would have been perfect for them to move and attack you. Or you might get really unlucky in the fact that they do a super, super attack card or they get a critical and you draw your, your miss or your null. There is the luck factor in the game. Then sometimes that luck factor balances out over the course of a scenario and, and sometimes it doesn't. But these two games that we failed, we have just hit scenario level three. So the way that Gloomhaven works, and most of you watching this will have probably played Gloomhaven. If you haven't played Gloomhaven, I'll try and explain it to you. What happens is there is a scenario level, and the scenario level is the average level of the party divided by two and rounded up. And that's how you work out the scenario level. So for example, two players starting at level one characters, the scenario level is one. As soon as those characters get to level two, the scenario level is still level one because it's Average level two divided by two, one rounded up one. So basically, both characters have to hit scenario uh, character level three before the before the game levels up to scenario level two. That's how it works. Now, what that means is, when you are just shy of it going up a scenario level, you are ahead of the curve. Is what I call it. Your characters have developed. Uh, you've got extra hit points. You've got extra equipment. You've got extra ability cards. You are a bit better. And then all of a sudden, the scenario level tips up and suddenly you're behind the curve again. So that's how sometimes you will find a scenario, oh, that was quite easy, and the next one, oh, that was really hard. Now, some scenarios are harder than others, but it's generally for us, I find it is based on 
whether you have just tipped over a scenario level or you're just below it. And we just, we just tipped up to scenario level three and suddenly these two scenarios were really difficult. Okay, now I posted on a couple of Facebook groups about this, including the Gloomhaven group uh, and some other Facebook groups that I'm on about the situation with replaying scenarios because I wanted to get other people's opinions on what they do. And this is also a question for the video log. So if you're watching this video log, obviously, please give the video a like and leave me a comment anyway. But I am curious to know what you do. Please put your comments in, in, in the vlog, uh, in, 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 the, in the video note thing. Do you treat it as a win? Which is what some people do. Some people have said, look, Paul, our time is limited. We don't want to replay the same scenarios more than once. If we fail a scenario, we just treat it as if we won. We don't get the XP rewards or anything like that, but we just move on because we want to play the game. We want to enjoy the game. And Gloomhaven, there's so many scenarios out. We don't want to replay a scenario again. I totally get that. I absolutely get that. Then there's the other extreme to say, you're cheating if you don't replay it again. I have replayed scenarios five to six times before I win. And that's the other extreme. And I totally get that point of view as well. Um, and, I, and I'd like to know what you do because from our point of view, we kind of were a little bit in the middle. Now, Gloomhaven, not Jaws of the Lion, but the main game of Gloomhaven, has the rules in there where you can modify the scenario difficulty level. Those rules are not in Jaws of the Lion, but there's no reason why you can't adapt them to Jaws of the Lion, um, where you can drop the level down a bit or you can make the level up a bit. Now, Vicky more than me doesn't want to replay scenarios again. We will, we will play it once more if we need to, but she doesn't really even want to do that. And, and I totally get that. We've got so many games to play. We've got so many adventures left of Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion and Gloomhaven with Frosthaven, not quite round the corner, that why would we spend our valuable time replaying a scenario because we failed the first time? Now, my point of view is, well, we'll do it better the second time and we'll learn from it and, it, and it, it'll be okay. Anyway, what I'm getting round to is we could drop the scenario level down from three to two. And that's exactly what Vicky said. She said, we'll play this scenario again, but I want to drop the scenario level down because I don't want to fail again. Now, my counter argument to that was, let's play it again on the same level, but just treat it as a win whether we, whether we succeed or fail. Now, we will still play the game properly. We will still try our hardest to win. So the fact that we will win whether we win or we don't isn't going to affect we're not going to go into the game and just be lazy and think it doesn't matter because we're going to win anyway no we will play the game properly and we will try and win the reason why i don't want to drop the level down is i want the game to be a challenge i don't want the game to be too easy if a game is too easy you feel like you haven't been challenged and you're just kind of going through the motions um so dropping it down to scenario level two for me would be too easy Keeping it at level three might be too hard. Do we just play it again? But then I came up with an alternative idea and I haven't yet spoken to Isaac about this and I'm actually going to develop it a little bit further. And that is scenario level 2.5. So you don't just drop the whole thing down by a level, but what you do is you pick randomly or through choice some of the monsters that you're going to meet and you drop their level down by one, but not all of them. So it's basically fractional difficulty settings and i need to explore this idea more but let me know what you think about it anyway are we still enjoying the campaign absolutely the fact that we failed the scenarios doesn't diminish our enjoyment of the game uh, i think we're near the end of the main storyline as i say we would have played tonight but i'm probably not going to be able to so hopefully by the next video log we might have finished the campaign you never know right moving on the 16th what day was this this was a wednesday wednesday the 16th of june Andy and Alan came round and we played Kanban EV. Now, I'm professionally involved in this game. I have been working with Vittle professionally now for, what, six or seven years? Uh, and I, I helped write the rulebook for this game and I created a, an official how to play video. So I'm afraid you're not going to get my personal opinions on Kanban EV. If you like Vittle Lacerda like game, Vit Vittle Lacerda style games, you're probably going to like this one. But the playthrough is on the channel. It is a tutorial and playthrough video. Uh, it's on the channel now. Just search for Kanban EV Gaming Rules and, and, and you'll find it. And that was Andy and Alan and we played it. Now, I was about to say something about the game, which is an opinion. <laughs> it's not it. I played terribly. Now, bear in mind, I played this before. Andy and Alan hadn't played this before. 
I played terribly and lost by a country mile. Andy and Alan are really smart. They'd read the rules beforehand. They'd watched my how to play video beforehand. We had a bit of a refresher at the start. I gave them some tips on what to watch out for. And then I just, I, I played terribly. I now want to play it again because I just played awful. Like all of the things that I was saying to myself at the start to do, I then somehow didn't do. I just got out of sequence with all of the things. Anyway, yeah, it was a really good game. Really enjoyed the game. Um, and it's on the channel now if you want to want to watch it. On the 17th of June, the day afterwards, I continued my Vital Lacerda week. <laughs> uh, and I did three games of Mikado de Lisboa, the solo game. Now, the reason why I did three is I was just going to do one. Uh, so Mikado de Lisboa is a one to four player game that's from Vital Lacerda and Julian Pombo. They co-designed it together and it is much lighter than a lot of other Vittles games. It's like four pages of rules or maybe two. But there is a solo mode with eight different scenarios in there. And I did one of the solo scenarios and I failed. So then what I decided to do was I did it again. And then I did it again. You will not find three videos on my channel. You will find one video, which is about an hour and a half long of Mikado de Lisboa. And if you look at it and you think an hour and a half for one video, you know, I mean, that's normal for some of the games that I do, but this is a 30 minute game. The reason is I did three games in the same video. Back to back, I just kept resetting it up because the solo game of Mikado de Lisboa, and I was not involved in this game at all. I did no development. I didn't do the rulebook. I didn't do anything for it professionally, so I can say what I want about it. The solo game is a little bit like a puzzle. There is a variable and a bit of a random setup to the puzzle, because otherwise you'd just solve it and then it'd be done. Um, but it does operate like a puzzle. And the first and the second games of it, I was definitely learning what I needed to do. So in the third game, I definitely had more of an idea of what to do. Now, I've spoken to a number of people about the solo mode of Mikado de Lisboa. Some people think it's really good. Some people think it's absolutely awful and tacked on and shouldn't have been there. My personal opinion is that I'm glad it's in there because there's eight different scenarios that you can play. If you don't like it, you don't have to play it. But the fact that it's in there gives that game more content, right? Like those playthroughs, I wouldn't have been able to do that day. Nobody was coming around. I was doing a solo game. The fact that I was able to play a solo game and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed the puzzle, would I play that scenario again? No, I wouldn't play that scenario again because I played it enough to learn it. And it, that was an interesting process and it was a live video. So there were people in the chat helping me and talking to me and it was really good. It was a really enjoyable experience. I wouldn't play that particular solo game again because that one that I played, I think it was scenario two or something like that, or maybe it was scenario one, I'm not sure. Um, but I felt by the end of it that whilst, as I say, I appreciate what it taught me and how to work out the puzzle, the random element of how well I did in that puzzle was a little bit too much out of my control for me. In that third game that I won, everything fell right. Now, I'm not saying that you can only win that scenario if everything falls right, because the better a player you are, you will be able to deal with other situations that crop up. But anyway, that's, that's that scenario. If you're interested in seeing a solo playthrough of Mikado de Lisboa, it's on the channel. Next up, on the 18th, this was a busy week. Yeah, this was a very busy week. On the 18th, I did The Magnificent. Uh, a friend of mine, Rob, came round and I did a two-player game of The Magnificent. Now, The Magnificent, there's an interesting story behind this game because I'm a big fan of Capital Lux. I say a big fan. Okay, I'm a fan of Capital Lux. It's a simple card game. It messes with your head. And it took me a few games before I had any idea of what was going on. And I was very, very confused. But then I liked it. Um, they did a Capital Lux 2. So I contacted the publisher, a Porter Games, and said, Hi, my name's Paul Grogan. Welcome to the latest gaming rules video log. No, um, you know, I'm a reviewer from the UK. I like Capital Lux. Is there any chance I could get a review copy of Capital Lux 2? And they came back to me and said, hi, Paul, yeah, we like your videos. We'd be more than happy to send you a copy of it. it would you also like a copy of Trails of Takana and The Magnificent? Now, I'd heard of The Magnificent because the year it came out at Essen, everybody was talking about it. Everybody was saying how great it was. And it's, it's one of the games that passed me by that Essen. Because Essen, for me, I'm not just there as a punter. I'm, I'm usually working, less so now than I was back then. But I was working full time. And I had some meetings and I just didn't have time to go around and look at games like I used to back in the good old days. Um, but The Magnificent, I kept hearing so many things about it and everybody was saying how good it was. 
I've got the publisher wanting to send me a review copy of it. And whilst I have a series of unplayed games, I'm like, yeah, go on then. And it's great. Really, really good. Um, very much a fan of the game. Did a tutorial and playthrough on the 18th. So if you want to see a two-player game of The Magnificent, that is on the channel now. Everything that everybody has said about the game, about how good it is, I absolutely agree. It's a solid game, plays in a good time, really good decision space. Fantastic. It is magnificent. There you go. I'm sure other people might have used that pun before. Next up, on the 19th, was another solo playthrough. Now, this is one voted on by my Patreon supporters. So every month, I do a number of solo playthroughs, but one of the solo playthroughs that I do each month is voted on by my Patreon supporters. And the one they voted on last month was a former bridesmaid for about the last six months, and that is Heroes of Terranoth. Heroes of Terranoth from Fantasy Flight Games, unfortunately not supported by any other expansions. Great game. Absolutely love it. I think it's brilliant. The game design uh, is, is fantastic. It is a spiritual successor to Warhammer Quest adventure card game that I also liked, but this is better. Now, I did a solo playthrough of it. Every month for the last six months or so, when I do the vote of what game, what solo game should I play this month for my patron supporters, Heroes of Terranoth is on there and it always gets a lot of votes, but it never gets enough votes. Well, last month in June, it did. So I did a solo playthrough of it on the 19th and it was great and I really enjoyed it. Now, the solo game of Heroes of Terranoth isn't really a solo game. You play two characters. So it's kind of like, well, I played it solo, but you have to dual hand it. It isn't a true solo game in that you only play one character. But anyway, that video is on the channel now, and I'm going to be mentioning Heroes of Terranoth very soon again. So next up, uh, 19th, this is Dragonfire. You will not find this video on the channel. Um, this was a Patreon only stream that I did where we played Dragonfire. Uh, and we use Tabletop Simulator. Uh, now the mod on Tabletop Simulator for Dragonfire is not an official one, but the reason why I used it is two of the people playing in the game have, we own a copy of the game. I have a copy of Dragonfire. Rick also has a copy of Dragonfire. So you might, you might disagree with this. And, and I know you're right in that that Tabletop Simulator mod for that game is technically illegal. But as I say, COVID, pandemic we can't have people around the house so we played it on tabletop simulator and as i say I, I i know it's an illegal mod did i feel bad using it i didn't feel bad using it because i've got a copy of the game and rick's bought a copy of the game. it's like yeah what's your opinions on this again this is another thing let me know in the in, in the comments of this video if you a don't play any games on tabletop simulator because they're all illegal rips which is wrong because they're not all illegal rips. Some of the games on Tabletop Simulator are legitimate authorized versions, but okay. So let's let's say you don't play any illegal versions of mods on Tabletop Simulator. You only play, real. and this question is for people who play games on Tabletop Simulator. I'm not, I, you know, if you don't play games on Tabletop Simulator, this question isn't for you. It's if you play games on Tabletop Simulator, do you not touch illegal games at all? Do you, you're probably not even going to want to tell me this, are you? Um, do you not care about that whatsoever or do you do what we do in that you only play it for games that you already own? Interested to see what you think. Anyway, Dragonfire. Um, I've been wanting to play Dragonfire again for a long time. I've played the physical game once, we played the introductory tutorial scenario, and Dragonfire has, I mean it's d and it's a party of adventurers entering a dungeon fighting monsters and, and everything else. It's not a role-playing game because all you're doing is fighting monsters. But since I last sort of dipped my toes into the water, I really wanted to try it again. This and Shadowrun Crossfire, I really want to try again. So that evening, a few of us got together on Tabletop Simulator. We struggled because the rulebook is a big rulebook. There's a lot going on. It's not particularly well-structured or organized. And we got confused by a lot of things. So the session didn't go smoothly. It was fun and it was enjoyable in the end, but it just took longer because we were all like how does this work oh but then there's this rule here uh, it's a game i want to play more of and i might be playing it again this saturday we will see um if you play Dragonfire, let me know um i've heard that it just doesn't work at fewer than four players there are rules for fewer than four players but i've heard it just doesn't work it doesn't scale well um but if you've played it let me know what you think next um 23rd is 
uh, two videos, they are on the channel now. Uh, so I did Mandala Stones, which is from uh, Board and Dice. Uh, I did that. That was a that was a playthrough, uh, three-player tutorial and playthrough video. It's an abstract game, really nice pieces. Uh, it's got some cleverness to it. It is a game that is one of the games that I would recommend if you are looking for uh, getting other people into games. So gateway games or games for non-gamers or family games, whatever you want to call it. Uh, things like King Domino, King, King Domino, I was about to say, King Domino, uh, Azul, um, Dragon Castle, Sagrada, things like that. Mandala Stones is, is up there. Uh, it isn't just a simple game like some of the classics. It's got a little bit of thinking about it, which makes it, I think, a good stepping stone to other games. So that's Mandala Stones. That's on the channel now. Three-play game of that. And Heroes of Terranoth. Because I enjoyed the solo play so much, uh, Paul and Emily were round anyway. This was on a Wednesday night. So we did a three-player game of Heroes of Terranoth. That's on the channel now if you want to go and watch that. So two videos for Heroes of Terranoth on the channel. Then, 25th of June. I said this was going to be a long video, didn't I? Virtual GridCon 3. So the 25th of June uh, should have been GridCon. Uh, GridCon is a convention based in the UK. It's about 220 people. Uh, me and Vicky organise it. Uh, and we did the first one in November 2019. And it's supposed to be twice a year, once in the summer, once in the winter, and then COVID hit. So we haven't done a GridCon since November 2019. The next GridCon, which is officially GridCon 2, cross fingers, will be running in November this year, two years after the first one. But that weekend at the end of June was supposed to be the date for GridCon. And we, we, we put it back. When it got to March and it was clear that lockdown restrictions were not going to ease anytime soon, uh, we made the decision to cancel it. So instead, I hosted a virtual games weekend. Now, unlike previous virtual games weekend, I decided to do something different in that I just told a few patron supporters. I, I told patron supporters that I was doing it. I didn't advertise it. I didn't ask any exhibitors to come and demo games at them because that didn't work out for me. Um, and I didn't do any raffle or anything like that. It was just Here's a weekend, patron supporters around the world playing games with each other. Really good fun. I streamed a few of them and yeah, really good. Unfortunately for me, um, yeah, I had some health issues in the few days before. So I didn't enjoy the weekend as much as I wanted to and I ended up having to cancel some of the streams. But let's focus on the good stuff. The 25th was the Friday uh, and the 25th of June will forevermore be known as Tekenu Day because I did four games of Tekenu that day. I did a Paul learns how to play the game from the rulebook and then played a two player game of it. That was a private video that I did for patron supporters in the afternoon. Thank you to everybody who kept me company for that one. That was really good fun. Followed by Paul learns how to play the solo game and then plays a game of it, which was pretty much straight afterwards. Uh, and again, that was a patron only stream. But then I did uh, an actual live solo playthrough of the game, which is on the channel now if you wanna watch it. Followed by Andy came round in the evening and we did a live two-player tutorial and playthrough of it. So yeah, I played four games of Tekenu in one day. Two of them were Patreon-only streams, while which was me learning how to play the game, and then the other two were public streams, which are on the channel if you want to uh, if you want to see it. Um, the second video of that was sponsored by Board and Dice, so thank you very much to Board and Dice for sponsoring those videos. And yeah, if you're interested in Tekenu, yeah, the videos on the channel. I can't really give my opinion on it because um, it was a sponsored video. But yeah, go and, go and check it out if you haven't already. I mean, other content creators covered the game a year ago. I'm a year late with my coverage of the game. Uh, and so many people who know the kind of games that I like were saying that you are going to love this game, Paul. There we go. What else happened? Saturday, the 26th of June. So this is the Saturday of Virtual GridCon 3. Rick came over and we did a three-player game of Too Many Bones. Now, how did we do a three-player game, considering it was just Rick that came over? Has Vicky suddenly decided that she likes Too Many Bones and she'll be on a stream? No. What we did is we did something that I don't think has ever been done before by anybody. It might have been. I don't know. And that is, we did a three-player game with one person sat next to me, or opposite me, and Scott remotely connected. So we played a three-player game, me, Rick, and Scott, but, Rick, uh, but Scott was a couple of hundred miles away. And it worked really well. So I shared my camera with Scott, he was connected via Skype. We were chatting to him. Uh, it all worked fine. 
we had obviously a couple of little audio issues because we had to be able to hear Scott, but we had to make sure that Scott wasn't being picked up by our microphones because otherwise everybody watching would have got echo. But yeah, it went really well. Now, we did a three play game of Too Many Bones. That is my ninth video of Too Many Bones this year. It is the first three player game that I've done. All of my other videos for that game have been uh, solo player, uh, yeah, solo or, or two player. Um, that is the first three player game I've done. So I knew it was going to be longer. Now, I don't actually remember that much about the game other than, yeah, it, it was very long because it was a three player game and Gendrix is like the longest scenario. Um, but I think we won. I'm pretty sure we won. I can't quite remember, but I think I think we won. Uh, but it was it was a great game. It's on the channel now. It's a long video. It's about five hours long, maybe even a bit longer. First time I played Too Many Bones 3 player, but it was excellent. Absolutely excellent. Really, really good. Next up, on the Sunday, I did two games on the Sunday. The first one is a game that's on my bucket list, and that is Dragon Pass. There's a long story with me and Dragon Pass. If we go back to the mid 80s, uh, when I was just getting into gaming, uh, a friend of mine had Dragon Pass. I mean, I was like 14, 15 years old. Hex and Counter War games were a thing, and Dragon Pass is a Hex and Counter War game. Oh, that breeze is nice. Um, set in the Glorantha universe, created by Greg Stafford, RuneQuest role playing game, and Chaos and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I remember trying to play it in the mid 80s, but it was a bit beyond us at the time. We were kids. We, we weren't ready for that kind of game, but I, I liked the thought of it and I liked the idea of it. And I used to have RuneQuest, the role playing game, as well. Uh, anyway, then I obviously grew up, moved on, lost contact with a friend who had it and everything else. And then there's, there's, a, there's a 20 year gap where I don't remember very much. But about 10 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, I had a copy. I had a copy of Dragon Pass. I don't remember where it came from, but I had a copy. And I've been wanting to play this game for like 30 years. I actually properly give it a go, properly try and play it. Anyway good friend of mine, Steve Pritchard, uh, who used to run Spellbinder games back in the 80s, for those who remember play by mail games. Yep, yeah, play by mail, not play by email. Um, he also used to work for Games Workshop during the time when they were doing the, the Lord of the Rings um, miniature games. But anyway, um, Steve came down to mine for a games weekend once and we were talking about Dragon Pass. And he said, yeah, I used to have a copy of Dragon Pass and I don't know where it went. So I went and got my copy of Dragon Pass from the attic and showed it to him and on the inside it said property of Sheffield University. It was his copy of Dragon Pass. So he took it back and I now don't have a copy of Dragon Pass anymore. But this game, as I say, it's on my bucket list. I have a few games on my bucket list. And on the 27th of June, 2021, I actually got a chance to play it. Peter Rushton, a patron supporter of mine, took some time to learn how to play the game and we played it on Tabletop Simulator. We played Scenario 1, and I am very, very happy that I've played it. However, the combat rules were a little bit old school. The cut Now, there's a lot about the game which is quite old school. It's a hex and counter war game. You have movement points. You move your little counters across the map. You know, really, the physical game has tiny little fiddly counters with tiny little numbers on that you can't really see. You know the usual stuff if you've, if you've played hex and counter war games. But there's some things about this game which are very clever in the way that some of the movement works and the way that the combat works and everything else. But the main combat mechanism was you look up your combat value on the table and then you roll a d6. And the differences between rolling a 1 and a 6 are massive. It was a game of extremes. And the way that the combat works, and this I found this very unusual, this is melee combat in the game between two armies, the attacker rolls first, and if they roll high, they'll wipe out the defenders and not take a single casualty. That seems unusual. I don't think I've ever played a game where melee combat has been resolved in that way before. And then whatever defenders are alive get to attack back at double strength. So it's basically, it's extreme. It really, really is extreme. And I didn't like it. I don't like that in a combat system. And the game that we played, whilst I enjoyed playing the game because it ticked off the bucket list, we had a game which was full of extremes. So, for example, Peter attacks me with a, with a force that's three times my size in melee combat and rolls a one and kills one of my little people. And then I fight back and I roll a six and kill his entire army. And then in the next fight, I'm attacking him 
he's in a stockade, he's actually got a higher defensive strength than me, but I roll a six and he rolls a one. And, the, and I know what you're gonna say, oh, it's combat, it's unpredictable. I don't care about that. I want to play a game and I want to invest my time, my energy into playing a game. And I don't want the result of that game to be decided by a few lucky dice rolls on an extreme combat system. We had a very extreme game where, as I say, the, these me rolling sixes and Peter rolling ones didn't just happen once or twice, it happened like three or four times. And as I say, I really enjoyed playing the game and I really appreciate Peter putting the time into learning it. And I would like to play it again, but I cannot play a game with that combat system. It was just, it was just weird. And I know the argument against it is, well, they're just the extremes. They are, they rarely happen. But they weren't that extreme. It wasn't 2d6 and take the, the average, or it wasn't an average dice. It was a simple d6 roll. So I'm talking to Peter about it. I'd like to play it again. And we are looking at various options. And I'm probably going to start a thread on my Board Game Geek Guild about this, about dice and average dice and things like that. But anyway, Dragon Pass, it's a game from 1985, I think, or even before that. Um, it was a Patreon-only stream, so it's not a video which which I would put public. Um, but yeah, it was interesting to play it. And yeah, I'm, I'm keen to play it again because we only touched the surface. We only played Scenario 1. You know, we, we just played some simple cavalry units fighting each other. We didn't use any of the extra rules, the magic, the shamans, the ducks. None of that. Yeah, ducks. Also, on the 27th, Terraforming Mars, which... If you listen to what I said about the game in January and haven't listened to any of my other content since, I have done not quite a complete U-turn, but a kind of 179 degree turn on the game. Now, I always said the game was good. I just said it wasn't as good as people claim it to be and it was overrated. And having now played it a lot more, the game is brilliant. Terraforming Mars is brilliant and I absolutely love the game. The app is gorgeous. The app is really, really good. They filtered out and they've sorted out most of the multiplayer issues with the game, and we played on the app. It was live streamed. Um, special guest was Mike from Ready Steady Play, and we played a four-player game of Terraforming Mars with the app on the Sunday. It's on the channel now if you're interested in watching it. Great game, really, really enjoyed the game, but that's because I really enjoy every single game that I play of Terraforming Mars. Sign of a good game. Right, moving on, July. We are now into July, the 2nd of July, Mage Knight, my number one favorite game of all time. And I got the opportunity to teach somebody how to play, which I absolutely love doing. I love playing Mage Knight. I love teaching people how to play games. Andy came around uh, and I taught him how to play Mage Knight and we played a two player game of it. So if you've always wanted to learn how to play Mage Knight and didn't know what it was about, that video that I did on the 2nd of July, 2021, I think is the best video that I have done on Mage Knight. It is a tutorial video where I teach Andy how to play gradually using the walkthrough book. Don't know what the noise was, probably Loki killing another bird. Um, and yeah, if you want to see a playthrough of the game or you just want to learn how to play, that's the video. It went on a lot longer than I expected. I thought it was going to be maybe a 90 minute video. It was about three hours long, uh, but it was really good. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just the tutorial scenario, but it's so good to play. So that's Mage Knight. Now, the reason why we did that video is because Power Plant Games, who are a patron supporter of mine, are currently running a Kickstarter. I think it's still running. I think right now it is still running, but they are running a Kickstarter for some play mats that you can use for playing Mage Knight. If you're into that sort of thing, I'll put some pictures on screen of the play mats now. Um, but yeah, the Kickstarter is still running and we used the play mats in the video. So it wasn't a sponsored video. Uh, Power Plant Games didn't pay me any money whatsoever. Uh, to create the video, but what they did do is they offered me um, two sets of play mats to give away to Patreon supporters. So if you were a Patreon supporter of mine, you would have got an email on how to enter the contest. 117 people entered the contest and I did the draw yesterday. The winners have been notified and they both mailed me back today to say that they got the message. So that contest is now over. Um, but yeah, if you want to back um, Power Plant Games' Kickstarter, go and check out the Kickstarter page. Next up, it's my birthday. It was my birthday on the 3rd of July. Um, it was my 27th birthday, I think, for the 24th time. Um, and 
we didn't do much gaming over the weekend. Um, traditionally, my birthday weekends are 30 people come over for four days and we play games here for four days. That's not happening at the moment because of COVID. Um, but we, we did a few things. And now, unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier on, my health issues and my sleeping issues, they were still going on at that point. So I didn't have the best birthday, um, but I had the best I could based on the situation that I was in health wise. We did spend uh, a few hours and we went out on the Saturday and we went out geocaching. But going back to the games, we actually played a couple of games that weekend of uh, Micro Macro Crime City, which has recently, yesterday, won the Spiel des Jahres Award. Um, now, I've had a copy of this game since it came out and just I've showed it to people, but I haven't actually played it myself. And I've been really wanting to play it myself because whether you class it as a game or not, it's fun. It doesn't take long and it's just a bit of fun. And it's something that me and Vicky can do together for 15 minutes and enjoy it. And that's all it is. And I want to do that. So we played one of the uh, cases. I can't remember which one it was that we played, um, but we, we played one of the cases. And then I posted about it on a Facebook group and people said, Paul, you want to use the advanced rules, right? You don't, just, just, just don't bother with the normal rules, play the advanced rules. And I'm like, advanced rules? What are the advanced rules? So what happens in this game is that you have a step, you have a deck of cards and you read the first card and it gives you a hint like where did the murder take place? And then you've got to find where the murder took place. When you found it, you find the location, you flip the card over. Was you right? Yeah, you were right. Okay. And then it, then you look at the next card and says, um, where did the woman with the, or where did the murder victim live? Okay. And then you go and look for that. So it gives you these leading questions. Okay. We played it, we enjoyed it, but it was quite easy. The advanced rules I'm always going to use from now on because we played it again a couple of days later and Vicky was a bit uncertain about this, but the advanced rules are you don't look at the cards. You literally don't have anything to go on other than I think the name of the case and a bit of something at the start. And after that, you've got to investigate. You've got to look around and you've got to try and piece together information yourself. It works a little bit like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, okay? In that, there's all of the information. Now you go and find as much as you can. And I was like, this isn't going to work. This really isn't going to work because how do you know where to go? And then what you do is when you think you've got all of the information, you get the cards and you treat them like questions. And the idea is, because in Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, you don't know what the questions are going to be until you end the game. It's exactly the same in this. So we did it. We used the advanced rules for the second one and it was brilliant. Really, really good. So suddenly we're looking at the map going, oh, we don't have any hints. We don't have any, not hints, but we don't have any guidance telling us what we should be looking for. So we've got to work it out ourselves. So wait a minute. There's, there's, there's the guy. It was a case about like a piano or something like that. So, right, there's somebody who's been crushed by a piano. Right, we've seen that. Now, oh, look at this. Oh, and that person. Oh, and there's this. Oh, and let's follow them back. And they're here. And oh, they're over there. Right. So where did they come from? So let's have a think. Why did they do it? Why, what was their motive? And we basically just explored as much of the map. It took longer to play, but the reward at the end, it was very rewarding because when we think we'd worked it out, we then went to the questions and it was like, where did the murder take place? Well, we know that one. Who did it? We know that one. Why did they do it? Where did they get the things from? Where did this come from? Oh, we know that one. It was really good. So we've only played two cases out of the 15 that come with the game. Definitely want to play more. I just need to convince Vicky to play it because it's great. Really, really good. Um, next up, 6th of July on Mars. Now, the reason why we played on Mars on the 6th of July is... When Andy and Alan came round for the game of Kanban EV, that was their first Vita Lacerda game that they played. Andy and Alan like heavy games. I knew they were going to like Vita Lacerda games. In fact, I'm very surprised that neither of them had played a Lacerda game before. But after that game of Kanban EV in June, we all agreed that we want to play more of them and they wanted to play more of them. So I said, well, On Mars is really good. On Mars is possibly my favorite Vital Lacerda game. So how about we play that one next? And it was all discussed and it was all talked about and we agreed, yeah, that's what we'd play. 
And then Eagle Griffin wanted me to do a video for the On Mars expansion that is actually on Kickstarter right now. And I said, well, well, this works out really well because it's been a while since I've played On Mars. So I'm going to have to replay the base game of On Mars to relearn it before then covering the expansion. So Andy and Alan came round on the 6th of July and we did a three player playthrough of On Mars. Again, that's on the channel now if you want to go and watch it. Really good game. As I say, probably my favourite Vital Lacerda game. Uh, yeah, and I think I think it was, I personally, patting myself on the back and being big headed for a minute, I thought it was a brilliant playthrough. I thought it went really well. I think we got, I think we got every single rule right. The only problem was right near the end of the video, Alan made a move. This was Alan's first game of it. He then decided to do something different, which we allow take backs because he's learning the game and we didn't take off his six points. So in the final scoring of the video, somebody left me a comment in the chat. Um, somebody left me a comment in the video notes to say, Alan didn't take his six points back for that move. Um, it didn't actually affect the outcome, but if you're watching the video, bear that in mind. When we did, when we undid Alan's move near the end of the game, we forgot to take his six points off. What was also funny about that game is, and I refer back to what I said earlier on, Andy and Alan have never played a Vital Lacerda game before. So when they were both learning on Mars by having a look at the rulebook and watching a previous video that I did for the game, Andy spotted himself in one of my videos playing on Mars. So not only does he not remember playing on Mars, he doesn't even remember that he was actually in a live video of mine. If you search for an On Mars tutorial and playthrough video on my channel, you might find two of them. Both of them have got Andy in. And it was so funny to see his, you know, his reaction when he searched for, you know, uh, On Mars tutorial and playthrough and up came an image with him in it. And he's like, I have no memory of this whatsoever. As he started watching the video, he started remembering bits of it. Um, anyway, we did that three-player game of On Mars, and as I say, I think it went really well. On the 7th of July, I did a solo game of Terraforming Mars with the app. I think that was a Patreon-only stream, um, but I played Terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars solo game, I don't think is a good solo game. I know a lot of people will disagree, right? But I like solo games, I like Terraforming Mars. The Terraforming Mars solo game, I don't think is a good solo game. The reason is, <sighs> the cards. You will you will get cards that are like, well, this is useless, this is useless, this is useless, this is useless. This one is really, really good in solo. In a multiplayer game of On Mars, On Mars, Terraforming Mars, in a multiplayer game of Terraforming Mars, I personally think the cards are all balanced. You might disagree with me, but I think, oh, this card is really good. This card's good. Oh, this card has a really strong effect, but it's worth minus one point. This card is actually quite weak and doesn't really do very much, but it's worth three points. The, and what I'm saying is, a multiplayer game of On Mars, oh, I'm doing it again, a multiplayer game of Terraforming Mars is about scoring points. So you have cards in there that are purely about scoring points. In a solo game, it's not about scoring points. It's about meeting the conditions. Now, if the game was, where well, you've got to meet the conditions to win, but then it's your score and try and score as many points as you can, then then maybe, and maybe that's what it is, I don't know. But I just remember playing Terraforming Mars solo the first time and beating it, and I'm like, is that it? Now, I do like playing it solo on the app because the app is gorgeous. I love the app. I think the app is absolutely fantastic, and it's a joy to play, and it does all of the admin for you. And I'm playing the solo game in order to learn the game a bit more, to learn some of the cards and to learn some of the the things about it. But other than that, I don't personally think it makes a good solo game. Next up, 9th of July was something a little bit special. Brussels 1893, I didn't have to teach the game. The idea was Nick and Gemma were coming round on the Friday evening. I said to them, because we were going to do one game which got cancelled, I said to them, what do you want to play? Nick and Gemma are always coming round and always playing my games and always being taught by me. So we decided to do something different. We played Brussels 1893, which I do not own. I have never played. Nick and Gemma own it. They've played it loads. They really like it. So I said, that's great. Are you happy teaching me the game? They said, yes. So they came round. They taught me how to play the game. Uh, and then we played the game. I really enjoyed the game. 
I, everybody had said Brussels 1893 is a fantastic game. Having now played the game, I absolutely agree. It is a solid Euro game. Really enjoy it. The downside is, and I don't wish this to sound too critical of, of, of Nick, who, who did most of the teaching. Hi, Nick. But a lot of rules were played wrong. Now, there were a number of rules that were played wrong during the game that we spotted during the game because I was reading the player aid and I was like, hang on a minute, this doesn't match what you told me. And it turns out that while we were doing the video, uh, there were a number of things that Nick and Gemma had been playing incorrectly in the game. But we caught them during the video. However, since the video went up on the channel, a number of people have left comments to say, you got this rule wrong, you got this rule wrong, you got this rule wrong. And I'm like, oh. So I personally don't feel comfortable in the fact that there is a video on my channel where a lot of the rules were played incorrectly. Now, my, as I say, my caveat to that was I wasn't the one doing the teach, but it's something that I need to think about. Um, if I'm ever in a situation again where somebody offers to teach, I think I might have to just read the rules myself beforehand first. Um, because again, I, I'm not comfortable with that video being on the channel. I could go back and add Klingon subtitles, um, but that's time and effort. And, I, you know, it, it wasn't a sponsored video. It was just done for fun. And I do need to try and limit the amount of hours that I put into these, um, you know, the videos that are effectively being done on my own time. Um, but yeah, and I also didn't mention at the start, turn on your Klingon subtitles. I probably need to start doing that more and more just in case there is something. Anyway, Brussels 1893 was fantastic, and I'm currently playing a game of it online asynchronously using uh, Boitage um, website, which is going really well. I'm not, I'm not winning. Next up, on the 9th of July, after the game of Brussels 1893, I did a couple of Patreon-only streams of Cubitos. Cubitos is a game from AEG, designed by John D. Clare. It's been described as a cross between Quest for El Dorado and Dice Masters and Automobiles. It's a racing game uh, that uses dice where you buy dice and then you roll all of your dice and there's a bit of a push your look mechanism to it. Um, anyway, I have recently covered the game on the channel as a public video, but on the 9th of July, we did a Paul, Nick and Gemma learn how to play the game from the rulebook as a behind the scenes videos for Patreon supporters. So um, yeah, that was good. And we actually played two games of it because we all enjoyed it. So speaking of Cubitos, let's jump forward to the 16th of July. Last Friday, um, I did a three-player game of Cubitos. Um, it was uh, me, Rick, and Emily, uh, and we played it. So that is public. That is on the channel now. If you're interested in seeing how to play Cubitos and a playthrough of Cubitos, I did a video of that. So yeah, if you're interested in that one, go and check it out. M going back to the 12th of July, I played Nova Luna. Uh, again, this was on Tabletop Simulator <clears throat> because one of the people uh, who owns a copy of the game. So it's it's the virtual equivalent of going around their house and playing their copy of the game. Sorry. Um, but yeah, we played it on Tabletop Simulator because I just fancied playing a game with some patron supporters. I only had about an hour and a half. So we played Nova Luna. Nova Luna is a fantastic game. I do not own a physical copy of the game. And I really would like to because I've played it about three or four times and I think it is a fantastic game. Now, interestingly enough, I'm not a big fan of patchwork. I know patchwork is really well respected by Uwe Rosenberg, but and I have a copy of it and I respect the game. I just don't get it. Whereas Nova Luna, although it uses one of the mechanisms of that, I think Nova Luna is a brilliant game. And if we're speaking about gateway games, like I mentioned earlier on for Mandala Stones, Nova Luna is probably higher up the list. If you are looking for a game to play with non-gamers or your family, Nova Luna, I, th I think is brilliant. Really, really good. And the reason why I think it's really good is that four experienced gamers also really enjoy it as well. And it is quite difficult to find a game which is good for non-gamers, but also is good for gamers. And a few games have managed to do that. And that's one of them. So, 13th of July, On Mars Alien Invasion. Following on from what I said about On Mars earlier on, uh, we did, again, Andy and Alan came round, and we did a three-player game of On Mars with the expansion. That is currently on Kickstarter right now. Now, the expansion for it, uh, On Mars is called Alien Invasion, a somewhat cooperative expansion. It contains four different scenarios or modules 
The first of which is a one versus many, where one player plays the invading aliens and all of the rest of the players play the humans on the base. Uh, two and three are cooperative scenarios, one's harder than the other. Uh, module four is a solo game. Now, I covered uh, scenario one. Andy and I played the humans and Alan played the alien. Um, so, yeah, if you want to see how that plays out, we do a tutorial. We teach you how to play. Um, we don't teach you how to play the human side of it because that's already been covered. But we go through how the alien player works. Now, what I will say in the game is the alien player... Um, this is a bit of a spoiler for what happened in the video, but the alien player is hard to play and Alan hadn't played it before and he was learning how to play. So if you watch that video and think, well, this wasn't really, this wasn't play tested at all. The aliens had no chance whatsoever. Okay. I can guarantee you the game was play tested and it is balanced, but playing the alien is actually really hard. Um, and it is no surprise at all that the player playing the alien on their first game will not do very well. Whereas the human players are just pretty much mostly doing what they would normally do in a game of On Mars. Um, but anyway, the Kickstarter is running now if you're interested in it. I'm also giving a copy away this month, but I'll come on to that in a minute. Almost there. How long have we been running? I don't know, but we're almost there. 16th of July, I did Distilled. Um, so I spent the day learning it. I learned how to play the game in the morning. I then did a practice game against myself or against two pretend opponents in the afternoon. And then on the Friday evening, before the game of Kubitos that I mentioned, uh, Rick and Emily came around and I did a three player game of Distilled. Distilled is doing, it's on Kickstarter right now. This was a sponsored video uh, to help promote the campaign. So I can't really give you my opinion on it. Um, but if you're interested in seeing a tutorial and a playthrough of Distilled, that is on the channel now. Apparently there were some audio issues with it, which I do need to look at. I don't quite know what the audio issues were. So if you watch it and the audio is bad, really sorry about that. I will try and fix that before the next video. Finally, on Sunday, um, Sunday, Saturday, Saturday, I play three games of Carom. Now, before you all go to Board Game Geek and look at what Carom is, it's not a Euro game. It's a classic game. It's Indian billiards. Um, I'll put a picture on screen now of me playing Carom. It is a cross between pool and crocodile. Uh, now, Vicky's parents went on holiday to India a number of years ago, and they saw this being played in hotels. They had like nice boards of this. And then a year or so later, they were um, in Bath, I think uh, like a Christmas fair or something or a Christmas market and they saw somebody selling copies of it and they went we're going to buy it so it was a Christmas present from Vicky's parents I don't know about five six years ago something like that uh, and Vicky was like why don't we take Karen with us because um, it was Vicky's dad's birthday uh, and we sat there outside and we played a few games of it so I had three games of it um, yeah it, it's 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 a little unusual and as I say it is a cross between uh, Crocodile and pool but it's one of those games where you go online to find how to play and you will find four different badly translated rule books none of which fit together so it's one of those games where you're probably going to have to make up some of your own rules for it but it, it was good fun really enjoyed playing it sat outside under the marquee playing that anyway that is almost it that is all of the games that i've played in the last five weeks it's been an awful lot Despite the health issues and the personal issues I've had going on for the last four weeks, that is a fantastic list of games. No wonder I've got a smile on my face. Um, yeah, there's been some brilliant games. I'm looking back here at this whole list now, and I'm trying to think if there's any game on here that I didn't enjoy playing. And the only one I would have to say, and it's not right to say that I didn't enjoy playing, it was Dragon Pass, which I enjoyed playing. But, as I say, had the issues with the combat system. And Dragonfire, which was a three-hour game over Tabletop Simulator, which could have been 45 minutes because we spent a lot of it struggling with the rulebook. Other than that, I did enjoy both of those games. It's just in terms of the experience was less on those than it was the others. Yeah, that, that's a lot of really good games there. Anyway, I said that was almost it. There's been some other games that we played as well. Unlock Legendary Adventures. This is box nine of Unlock. This is out in French, but is not out in English yet. Uh, 
I'm one of the English testers. Uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the English editor of all of the text and we do all of the testing as well. So it's actually me and Vicky who do it uh, and also Rick um, and his partner, Victoria, who do it. So for the last few boxes, in fact, probably the last four or five boxes of Unlock, um, we've been the editing and testing team for the English version. So we played them, but it, it's work, right? We are, we are testing them. We are checking to see if the, if the puzzles work. Uh, we have a, a reduced experience because some of the puzzles that we have do not work because the app isn't ready. So some of the puzzles we can't actually do and we have to just look up the answer. Um, but it's editing work as well. We have to go through every single card. We have to edit the text on every single card. We have to edit the text on the app. It is work, but I've recorded these as games played. Me and, me and Vicky love escape room games. We love puzzle games. We love escape room games. So the fact that we help to make the English version of these games better for you to be able to play, it's a job that we get paid to do, but it's an enjoyable part of the job. What I will tell you is that if you enjoy the Unlock series of adventures, we all discuss this afterwards. So this is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of the four of us who tested these scenarios. These three scenarios are some of the best scenarios ever. This might be the best box, I think. It's really good, really good. The theme of these three scenarios is really good. Anyway. There you go. He says, not giving his personal opinion. <laughs> I mean, if you don't like Unlock and you don't like puzzle games, you're not going to buy it anyway. But if you are an Unlock fan, Box 9, excellent. We also did Detective Society. Um, they don't want to call it Season 3, but it is Season 3. Uh, we are part of the testing team for Detective Society. Uh, and on the 20th of June, we tested Detective Society Series 3, The Curse of the Expedition, I think it's called. Um, episode one. And in fact, this Saturday, we're testing episode two. Now, if you backed the game on Kickstarter, you won't be getting episode one for another, I don't know, four or five weeks or something like that. But we are we are in the testing cycle for those games. We are one of the early testers of it. So after we've tested it, it goes off and it has loads more changes. So by the time we test episode two, we find out all of the things that changed since we last played it. So again, it's work, it's enjoyable, but we are not having the full final experience that you would get um, if you actually backed the game. That's everything. That is all of the games that I've played. Time for a cup of tea. Wow, that was a lot. We haven't mentioned this guy or this yet. So moving on, Patreon update. So every month I give an update on the current state of the Patreon campaign and continuing the trend of the last few months, and I say this every single month, the start of the month, it always starts to go down, okay? but then it usually picks back up at the time I do one of these video logs. Um, I, I don't know what it is, um, but every time I do one of these video logs, Patreon support goes up. So for the last four months, it has been start of the month, it, it gradually drops like this, and then I do a video log and it, and it gradually goes up again. So that, that was the case in June, and that's, that's the, currently the case in July. So as always, a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters uh, who have stuck with me. I know a lot of people have had to cancel their support in the last month and that's fine. Obviously the reasons for doing so are their own, but a lot of them are down to the current financial situation and people who have been affected by that. Um, if you like the content that I create, if you don't know what Patreon is, it is a crowdfunding platform. A lot of the content that I create on the channel is not sponsored. This video, for example, I've taken most of today off my paid job in order to create this video and therefore I'm only able to do this through the support of the Patreon campaign. So patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Go and check out the Patreon page if you're interested, even if you're only able to support at a dollar a month. Every little bit helps, as a certain supermarket says. Um, but let's have a look at the situation for June. So on screen now is a list of all of the new Patreon supporters that I got in June. Uh, and as always, uh, just so that there is full transparency, there were 24 new people that joined, but 15 people left. So the net increase was nine new supporters in the month of June. So yeah, a huge thank you to every, all of my new supporters. But again, all of my existing supporters as well who've been with me. Some of, some of them have been with me now since the start, which is what, two and a half years? Something like that. So yeah, huge thank you to you because, you know, when I look back at what I was doing pre-Patreon, where all I was doing was rule books and sponsored videos, I'm much happier with what I'm doing now. I'm much happier with half of my work 
or more than half of my work being funded through Patreon, which means I'm able to do more live playthroughs, fun content, these video logs, etc, etc. Much better than writing rule books, trust me. And as of right now, we're in July. Uh, currently, we are a, at a, a net loss of two Patreon supporters. As I mentioned at the start, it's always the case. At the start of every month, it goes down, and then near the end of the month, it seems to pick up again. So that's, that's just the cycle of how it goes. Um, talking about plans. I kind of have something in mind. Um, when I get to 700 patron supporters, I, I was going to do something new. Now, I'm currently, as of right now, 697 patron supporters. I might hit 700 patron supporters by the end of this month. I'm not sure. But my next plans are that I'm going to convert this log, this video log, uh, and my live Q&As into podcasts. Um, but again, what the reason why I'm only doing it at that point is it's going to take time and it's time I currently don't have. So what I need to do is I need to look at possibly uh, getting somebody else to do that for me, which means paying them to do it for me, which means it's, it's a cost. So that, that's probably what I'm gonna do. When I get to 700 Patreon supporters, which might happen this month, is I will look at paying somebody to convert the video logs and the live Q and A's into podcasts, which can then be uploaded and be available as a Gaming Rules podcast. I used to do a podcast a few years ago, which was like an in, uh, interviews and discussions and things like that. This would just be basically the audio versions of those things. But if that a few people have said that that's something they'd be interested in. So yeah, it, as I say, we're getting close to 700 patron supporters, so that might happen soon. The other thing that I've had an idea to do, and I'm mentioning it here, is Paul's Random Ramblings. Now, I think this is a great idea, but... I'm nervous about the overhead on time because what I'm thinking of this being is a once a week thing at the same time every week or on the same day every week is a five to ten minute video, not live, where I filmed it, where I ramble about a certain topic like average dice, uh, publishers cancelling games and why you should st still play them, uh, you know, all, all sorts of things like that. Um, and I would I would get ideas from my patron supporters of just Here's a topic, we want you to talk about this for 10 minutes. And basically, it's a video of me rambling at the camera for 10 minutes, and I then ed edit it very lightly and upload it. Paul's random ramblings. It's an idea I've had. At the moment, I'm not able to do it. Um, but again, if the patron support continues to increase, then I will basically, I'll find a way to make it happen. Maybe I'll do that at 750 patron supporters. I'm not sure. It's something I want to do. Um, I just, I'm not too keen on setting goals at the moment because of the current situation. It feels like I don't really want to do that. I'm not sure if other people are doing it. Maybe I should just stop worrying about it. Anyway, contest. Every month I do a contest. I do a giveaway uh, for one of my patron supporters at producer level or higher. Last month's giveaway was for my copy of Anachrony. Okay, so my original copy of Anachrony with the miniatures, with the broken token insert, valued at I don't know what quite a lot, I think. But because I have the new Anachrony Infinity Box, I no longer have a need for my original copy of Anachrony, which I paid for. I bought that. I think I think other people probably just sell the game, but I wanted to do I wanted to give it away to somebody. So every month I do a draw. If you are a patron supporter of mine, you don't need to do anything. You automatically get entered into the draw. And I did the draw a couple of weeks ago. Now it's a big heavy box. I do not fix the draw whatsoever. And I said, whoever wins this, I will send you this game. Knowing full well, it might have cost me 50 quid to send the game around the world, right? But I went, I don't care. I'm going to give this to one of my patron supporters. And as I was doing the draw, I was saying to myself, please let it be somebody in the UK. <laughs> please let it be somebody in the UK. And I did the draw. Congratulations to Andrew Mason, who is in the UK. Not only is Andrew in the UK, but Andrew and his family are going on holiday to North Devon in a few weeks' time. He is driving within like five or six miles of my house. So I'm going to meet him at a motorway service station and I'm going to physically give him the copy of Anachrony. Um, yeah, so it, it's actually worked out quite well. Um, the, yeah, the person who won, congratulations, Andrew. Uh, he's, he's, he's actually, I'm going to be able to hand it to him physically. So there you go. That was last month's contest. This month's contest is to win a copy of On Mars Alien Invasion, the expansion set for On Mars. 
Thank you very much to Eagle Griffin for giving me a copy. Well, they've not given me a copy because they don't exist yet. But basically, if you are a patron supporter of mine at producer level or higher, then at the end of this month, I will do a draw and you could win a copy of the game. Apologies for the, uh, the curtain blowing. I could close the window, but I don't want to because that little bit of breeze is very refreshing. So anyway, yeah, if you aren't a patron supporter of mine, maybe now's the time. If you want to be in with the chance of winning Alien Invasion, the On Mars expansion, all you need to be is a patron supporter of mine at the end of this month, at producer level or higher, and I will do the draw at the start of next month. Thank you again to Eagle Griffin uh, for giving me a copy of that. Right, let's move on to what are my plans for the next few weeks? Well, this week, Wednesday, i.e. tomorrow, probably today by the time this video log goes out, Distilled Solo. So I've already covered the three-player uh, version of Distilled. Tomorrow I'm going to be covering the solo game of Distilled. Again, that's sponsored video to help with the Kickstarter campaign. Not that they need the help because the Kickstarter campaign is doing really well, but I'm going to be doing a solo playthrough of that tomorrow. On Friday, I'm doing a solo playthrough of Merv from Osprey Games. That is not a sponsored video, but Osprey Games asked me to do it. So how does that work? Well, Osprey Games are a client of mine, right? I like what Osprey Games do. Osprey Games are a company who I, I like the games that they produce. I want to do more work with them, and I am actually doing some professional work with them. Therefore, when they say, Paul, would you mind doing another solo, play, solo playthrough of Merv? I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fine. So I'm taking out my time to do it. I'm not charging them for it, but it's because I have a professional working relationship with them. That said, I did ask them, could I have a copy to give away to one of my patron supporters? And they said, yes. So there will be a future giveaway for a copy of Merv. Watch this space. Um, the week after, I am planning to cooperate with Luke Hector from The Broken Meeple on something. We have agreed what it is. I can't remember what it is, but I should be doing that next week. It's overdue, it's well overdue, and that's down to me, um, because I've just been too busy. But I'm looking forward to doing something next week with Luke on that. Also, next week is the live Q&A, because it'll be, it'll be the end of the month, so the last Wednesday of the month will be the live Q&A. And... Next month, starting on the, is it the 8th? I think it's the 8th. No, it's not the 8th. Anyway, starting in August, coming soon, Arkham Horror LCG. It's been 15 months since we played, but COVID restrictions are starting to ease in the UK. We are going to be starting the Arkham Horror Living Card Game Forgotten Age campaign. It'll be twice a month, every month for the rest of this year. Well, until November... Uh, and then we'll finish it. So same players as last time. Me, Emily, Andy, Alan, starting again. Can't wait. It's been so long since I played it. Arkham Horror LCG, fantastic game. Absolutely love it. Also, end of this month, UK Games Expo, which I'm not going to. So some of you watching this might be thinking, oh yeah, we're going to meet Paul at UK Games Expo. When can we get our pro promo tile for uh, the Cullumpton Under Falling Skies promo title. Where can we get our gaming rules dice and where can we give Paul our pack of Jaffa cakes and things like that? I'm not going to UK Games Expo. I was going, but now I'm not. So why am I not going to UK Games Expo? Well, it isn't because uh, of the restrictions or the lack of restrictions that UK Games Expo were not putting in place and then are putting in place. Um, it's because Vicky's sister is getting married the week after UK Games Expo. I, we, have, we have tried looking at a number of other options. Um, and it is, you know, the UK Games Expo have now said you've got to wear a mask inside and there'll be social distancing and everything else. The chance of me getting COVID from UK Games Expo, considering I'm double vaccinated, everybody inside will be wearing a mask. Everybody inside will be either double vaccinated or have a certificate to say that they haven't got COVID. I think it will be safe, okay? It's probably safer going to UK Games Expo than it is going to your local shop. I, I think, I might be wrong, I don't know. So I think it is gonna be safe to go to UK Games Expo. But if I get COVID from UK Games Expo, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind personally because we can't beat this. We've tried, we can't. It, it, there's going to be variant after variant after variant. 
We cannot continue to live in our bubbles at home, never leaving the house and being scared to do anything, okay? We, we, just, we just can't. And if it was not due to the fact that Vicky's sister was getting married the week afterwards, I would be going to Expo. And if I got COVID, I got COVID, right? I'm going to be safe. I'm not going to be stupid. I'd wear a mask and everything else. But I can't, we can't take the risk. We cannot take the risk that I come back and I have it and then I give it to Vicky and Vicky can't go to her sister's wedding. We've talked about this for the last two weeks and I on Saturday I made the difficult decision that I'm not going to go to UK Games Expo. And it's for that reason and that reason alone. If UK Games Expo was the day afterwards or the week afterwards or even two weeks before, if it was two weeks before the wedding, it would be fine because I'd go there, come back, stay at home after seven or eight days, still no symptoms, right, fine, we're all, we're all good to go. Um, so that, that's the reason why I'm not going. Now, if you are going to UK Games Expo and you are a patron supporter of mine, then how do you get the Under Falling Skies promo card and how do you get a gaming rules dice? Well, Rick, a good friend of mine, is going to UK Games Expo and he has a stash of them. So if you are going to UK Games Expo and you would like to get uh, that, uh, Rick's organising uh, a meetup, ideally through the Slack channel. If you're not on the Slack channel, I can't recommend going on the Slack channel enough because that's where a lot of stuff happens. But if you're not on the Slack channel and you are a patron supporter, and you are going to UK Games Expo, please drop me an email. Uh, the plan is that we're going to arrange that Rick is in a certain place at a certain time, and then he'll be there for like 15 minutes or whatever, and that is the opportunity. Rick's only going for a day, and it's not fair on him to, to go too much out of his way and spend the whole day going around giving promos. So that, that's the idea, uh, but we've got to sort out the admin, like who's entitled to them, ticking people off the list when you've got one, etc., etc. But anyway, that's what we're going to try and do for that. So that's why I'm not going to UK Games Expo. Instead, I am going to be spending three days at home playing games, okay? Because I'm missing out on going to Expo, so I'm going to be doing some games at home. I'm organising uh, another virtual gaming weekend for those patron supporters of mine who can't go to UK Games Expo for whatever reason. Either they're not in the country or they're in a similar position to me or they can't go for their own reasons. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing some games online that weekend. That's pretty much everything that I've got planned for the next few weeks. There'll be more stuff. Um, I just haven't planned too much yet. So personal news. Um, yeah, as I mentioned at the start, um, I'm really glad that I'm doing this video log this week because I am in a much better state physically and mentally than I was last week. Uh, I've mentioned over the last couple of video logs that things have been difficult for me. That's not been getting any worse. And then about three weeks ago, things took a really really bad turn for the worst. My mental health uh, suffered quite badly and I was really struggling through every day and sleeping issues, yeah, really, really quite bad. Uh, as I say, my birthday weekend was affected by that uh, and then I've had a terrible couple of weeks. I've got through the worst of it now, thankfully. The last, the last four or five days have been generally okay. Uh, that's just how it is with some of the issues that I've got. So yeah, thank you as always to, for all of the messages of support um, because I've been using, I've been doing some private streams here and there and I've been chatting to people on the Slack channel and that's really helped. So yeah, big thank you to all of your support for that. Um, birthday, let's talk about what I did for my birthday weekend. Um, had some Jaffa cakes, went geocaching. I mentioned the geocaching earlier on. Um, things that I got given, so yeah. I got some Jaffa Cakes from various people. Thank you very much for those people who sent me some packs of Jaffa Cakes in the post. Got an armadillo, which if you were at the last live Q&A, you will know where this came from. So thank you very much to Graham for my armadillo. Um, I also got some Marvel Champions packs. I got the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and the Wasp. Thank you very much. I don't technically know who they came from, but thank you very much to the person or people who sent those. Much appreciated. Um, and yeah, as I say, all in all, I had, I had a, a good birthday weekend considering the state that I was in at the time. Now, I am still owed a 50th birthday games weekend from last year, and now I'm owed a 51st games weekend for this year. So at some point, I will be having a games weekend where I'm going to invite loads of people around and we're going to play games all weekend. We're allowed to do that now, and it's about time. It's going to be after the wedding, but maybe at some point in the next couple of months, I'll be doing something like that. Um, what else has been happening? 
the Millennium Falcon has finished. That's why it's here. The Millennium Falcon is finished. Um, six months it's taken. Now, I, I made one of the feet. I didn't build this. This is Vicky. This was my present to her for Christmas, but it is now finished. And after, after months of looking, we have found a coffee table, uh, a glass contained coffee table, which will fit it. Uh, and Vicky's parents, uh, they, they repair and they do up like antique furniture and stuff like that. So we, we bought one. It was quite badly damaged and scratched, but Vicky's parents have, have done it up and I'll put a photo on screen now. So this is the new, the coffee table that we've got that the Millennium Falcon goes in. I took it out of the coffee table to bring it and put it on this table so that you could see it. But yeah, that is now finished with the little porg on top. The danger is every time you move it, a bit falls off. Um, so yeah, when I moved it this morning, two bits fell off. I've got to put them on before Vicky notices. We're all done. Um, yeah, that's everything. Whew, right, I'm going to go and edit this video after I've had another shower. <laughs> it's two or three showers a day at the moment. We actually bought an air conditioning unit yesterday because the heat is just... By the time the air conditioning thing arrives, it's just a small portable one, um, the heat will have probably died down. But the, the room where I do the filming, the studio where I do the filming, has been unbearable. Now, we can't have the aircon on while I'm doing the streaming, but the plan is to keep it in keep it on in the room during the day, uh, keep the door closed and the window closed, it vents out the window, uh, and then when people come around in the evening, it's nice and cool. That's the plan, because it's not fair on the people who come around to play games, that they are literally dripping with sweat, and it's hard for me to concentrate on the rules of a game as well when I'm, uh, you know, almost about to faint. So that should be arriving this week, um, along with some other goodies. Anyway, we're all done. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but thank you very much to everybody for watching. Thank you again to all of my patron supporters for your support uh, that makes this video and a lot of the other videos possible. I will be back with a live Q&A next week, but I'll be back with another video log in August. Hopefully a little bit earlier, but you never know. We'll see what happens. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching. is proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com